Welcome. Thanks for coming. Boy, this is humbling. You know, um, I can remember uh, years ago coming here to this building with my kids when they were little, when it was the San Francisco Exploratorium. Anybody ever come here when it was Exploratorium? You know, and I just, like, it's, it's humbling to be here in, in this other context, but I really hope that over the next couple days we can share that, that same kind of interactive learning. I mean, that's really what, what the purpose is of this. It's not so much to hear just like us feeling about stuff, it's to interact with each other and, you know, go hear the different sessions that the, the different customers and, and partners are putting on. I think, I think that's where the real learning is gonna, is gonna take place. Um, you know, on behalf of, of Lloyd and Ben and myself, I mean, just thanks for coming. I, I think this will be a good couple days. Um, how many people are here this year, we're a little bit bigger, um, from outside of the Bay Area? Wow, that's great. Um, how many people are here, a little informal data survey, how many people are here from outside of the U.S.? All right, a little more international this year. I mean, we did last year in New York, I think we, we were able to draw some, some folks from Europe, but thanks for coming so far, I really, really do appreciate it. And, and how many people were here last year for JOIN in New York? Wow, not that many. Um, so, so what I thought we could do is maybe take a step back and review a little bit of some of the stuff that we kind of teed up last year, because I think, you know, our strategy maintains the same. I think we see this trend happening and we continue to ride this wave. Um, and I talked a lot last year about the, the three waves of data analytics tools and infrastructure and stuff like that. So let me, let me just run through that real quickly to, to kind of set the, the context for the rest of the, the next couple days. Um, you know, to understand where we're going, I, th I think you have to understand a little bit about where we've been. And, and where we started this journey, you know, 30 years ago was with the big monolithic data stacks. Right? It was like the first wave of BI. And those were the, the business objects and Cognos and Hyperion, the systems that sort of started it all. And those systems were incredible. I mean, they did everything. You know, I mean, they did data transformation and reporting and, and governance and all that stuff. And, and when you wanted to ask a question, like, you know, close the quarter or do financials, you got answers that were arguably 100% accurate. I mean, no, 100% accurate. It was, there was not a lot of confusion. Things were pretty, pretty buttoned down in those kinds of systems. But those systems grew up around the idea and evolved around the idea that the was slow and it was expensive. Right? So, so Oracle CPU licenses back then were expensive, and you had to be careful about the analytic load that you put on those databases. And, and I think that evolution on top of that caused certain behaviors. Like when you wanted to do stuff, you'd have to like pull data out and manicure it perfectly and put it into a cube and data engine, stuff like that, and then you could, you could operate on it. And I think that got frustrating, and you know, around seven years ago, you know, we kind of blew that up. And, and last year at JOIN, I used this horrible morning analogy of an exploding whale. Uh, and the marketing team said, Frank, never use that one again. But I'm gonna use it anyway. Uh, so I don't know if anybody remembers that old video of the whale that washed up in Oregon and uh, they had to get rid of it. So they, the Department of Transportation decided to load it with dynamite and blow it up. And, and then all the seagulls would come and kind of pick the pieces away. Made sense, right? But what happened was a totally unexploded or uncontrolled explosion, completely uncontrolled. And, and big pieces of the whale went flying into the air and the, you know, the local news crews were there and they were filming this, of course. And like people were running for cover, like it crushed cars. There's like old Volkswagens and stuff that were crushed with a dead whale. And that's kind of what happened as we blew up the, the first wave of BI. I mean, we kind of created a mess. And I think I was part of that. I mean, I, I tell, I'm, I'm to blame for this. I, you know, I thought it was a good idea at the time too. And what happened was we said those systems were so inflexible that we were gonna kind of piece the stack apart and give everybody self-service tools so they could go into the departments and kind of do their own thing. And it, it was great for people who understood the stuff that they were working on. Like if I was a sales ops person, I could do like pipeline analysis because I understood that data and I knew what was right and stuff like that. Um, but, but what happened is we tried to piece things back together and, and use data in a more holistic fashion across a whole organization. Those things didn't really fit that well together and they were still evolving, you know, at the time that the database was, was pretty expensive. 
right? So we were still working on this extraction idea. And we had pieces for data wrangling, we had pieces for data prep, we had pieces for, you know, visualization, exploration, you know, all that stuff where it was kind of different pieces. But, but they were really valuable in their own rights, but as you tried to put them together, it became difficult. And that really, like, made our users, the data consumers, you know, frustrated. And, and I think as we go out and talk to customers, as we go out and talk to you all, we always hear one of these two problems. We either hear the idea of a data breadline, right? So like think of area, era breadlines where, where you know, people are, are waiting for data to put into their self-service tools. So they go to the data team's queue and they say, I need a million rows of data for this. Can you give it to me? And they get it and they go back and they do some analysis. They find some cool stuff, awesome. And they're like, that's not quite right, I need some more. So then they go back, but this time there's like three or four people already standing in line, right? And everybody's kind of hungry for data. And then they go back and they, they figure it out. And then they go back and there's 100 people standing in line. And they're just not gonna wait again. They're not gonna wait again. The queue has gotten too long. So, so they either stop asking questions, which is really problematic if you're trying to drive this idea of people using data. You know, they have to be able to get, get the data to, to get the answers. Or, they go rogue, right? They cause this second problem, which is data chaos. And data chaos is this phenomenon where we see people operating on their own data thinking that it's accurate, right? So they're either like, hey, I, I can't get the data that's officially from the data team, so I'll, I'll kind of extrapolate last month's data, or I'll go directly to the source systems. And I think I understand how like Salesforce is giving me this stuff, but oops, I, I, I'm not really calculating it right. And suddenly we all think that we're talking about the same metric lifetime value of a customer, but we're really not talking about the same thing at all. Like they're totally different numbers calculated in different ways. And then we have these fights called data brawls, right? People fight it out. And that's a problem, and that is a big problem to creating this idea of, of data democracy. It really is fundamentally these, these problems that we have to solve. And last year we set out, you know, this idea that we saw coming together and what Looker was born out of, which is really to, to recreate a whole different kind of stack that got around some of those problems, that really started to address those problems. So we see this third wave of data tools you know, coming to use. And these tools did not evolve around the idea that the database is expensive. They grew up, and Looker grew up, with the idea that the database was cheap, and it was designed for analytics. And this whole crazy thing called big data happened, and, and suddenly we could go get, you know, Amazon Redshift or Google BigQuery or Snowflake or Presto or any of the Hadoop stuff or, you know, any of those things. And we could start to collect and store everything. And our little company could suddenly be like, like Google or Facebook scale. Like we could really do this, this, this data thing at a whole different level. And that infrastructure world was a revolution, right? It was a revolution. It was one of the biggest things that happened in tech in the last 10 years. But the tools on top were kind of just evolving. So we had revolution and evolution. Right? And they didn't quite match up. And, and I think what we've seen you all do over the last year is really put this platform to use, right? We put this technology to use. It hasn't always been easy. It's been, a, it's been a hard fight. But we've seen you start to address these fundamental issues of data breadlines and data chaos. But, you know, this year at Join, I want to take a step back. And, you know, Simon Sinek's here. We're going to talk a little bit about culture and stuff like that. But really, you know, you know I, I had to go back and say, start with why, but why? You know, it's his first big book. And, and the why, you know, why are we here? Why are we going to spend two days talking about this subject? Why are we going to go into all these breakouts? Why did people prepare all this content, right? The why is the exciting part. And I think it's, it's, it's exciting, especially because I feel like we're almost there. We're like on the last mile. You know, some of us have been doing this for 20 years, maybe longer, trying to figure out how to put data in the hands of people. And, and it sort of feels like with all this infrastructure revolution, with all this hype around big data, with all these new tools, with all this stuff, with all these people coming out of school, you know, with, with the title data something, it, it's really like we're almost there. It's like the last mile. And we just have to go that last mile, I think. I think we are getting close. And the why, the why we're doing this and the why we're here is to finally create this crazy thing called data culture. You know, to put data in the hands of not one person, not just the CFO, not just the CEO, right? To put data into the hands of everybody so that they can sort of ask and answer their own questions and they can drive a little bit based on fact 
instead of this idea of the hippo, right? The highest paid person in the room making all the decisions. That's why we're doing it, right? And I think last year was a lot about the what, and this year has to shift to be a little bit more about the why. And it's funny, I never thought I'd be up here talking about data culture. I remember like when we first started out, we were a little Santa Cruz company, and we go and we were helping some of the early customers, and they all started to say, well, you guys are like, you're like shifting the culture of our company. Like people are, are moving from this subjective stuff to this more factual stuff, and it's really interesting. And I said, I said, Lloyd, we can never say that. Like people will think we're crazy. Like everybody's been saying that it's goofy, right? But what's happened is, is you all are telling us this, and we're actually seeing it happen. We're seeing this shift where we're, we're not just using data in pockets or month-end reports or stuff like that. We're starting to use data to do our jobs day to day. And I think the reason we're starting to hear this from people is because this data chaos and breadlines is what's been holding us back. It's really these, these, these last problems are what's been holding us back. And it's kind of like, um, like hunger, right? When you're hungry, you can't go do other things. I, I, like psychology class back in college, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, if you're focused on hunger and shelter, you can't be focused on the big things like self-actualization and all that crazy stuff. Um, it's like that in data. Like, we're so focused on these base needs that we can't sort of look up and say, well, what more should we be doing? I mean, there's a little bit of that, like, oh, we think AI is going to be the thing, and there's all these different things. But really, we're not really holistically looking at where we could take this. And where we could take this is not to some technology step, it's to actually shifting the culture of the companies that we're supporting. Right? That's the why. And, like, I personally, I really do, I'm kind of excited about this, you might sense this from me, but, but, like, we're at the crest of the hill. Like, we've been going up this hill, we've been going up this hill like a long hike, and suddenly you get to the top of the hill and you look out, and there's like a city over there, you're like, oh, that's what it is, I've crested the hill and I can see it now and I want to go there, right? And that's where we need to go, to this idea of creating data culture. And it's even more interesting to me because there's like a workforce who cares about this. There's this new workforce in our companies that actually cares about this. They're hungry for data. And that's shifted. I mean, that's even shifted in the last three or four or five years. There's these new people who, who are not operating on like PowerPoints and end of month stuff. They're operating every day in data to inform what they're doing that day, to bring us like competitive advantage, to bring us core efficiencies. Right? They're using data to do those things. And this new workforce is what's gonna sort of drive this whole thing. And these, these people have titles. Like they're real jobs. They're like the quantitative marketing person, the growth hacker, the data-driven product manager, right? The whole customer success team is always working with this data stuff, right? They're informing like, where should they focus today? They should focus on this because the data is telling them that. It's like they're plugged into everything. And I think if the 1990s were about like the knowledge worker, I hated that term at the time, the knowledge, you know, like, like Today is about this instrumented workplace and this instrumented workforce where people are plugged in to everything. And what's going through the plug is data. What, like, the least common denominator of what is, what is being shared here is this data stuff. And if we can bring it together and make it usable for people, we can actually drive this notion of data culture. And I think our job is to empower this worker. Our job is to go back into our organizations and find people and empower them, right? It's, it's like a big, big job, and we have to go identify them and empower them and make them capable of doing their job better. So this idea of creating data culture will require cultural leaders, right? I think Simon talks a lot about that. Um, and, and everybody in this room is a cultural leader. You know, when it, when it comes to creating this new data culture, data driven, data democracy, whatever you want to call it, but, but really just putting data in the hands of people so they can be curious and inform what they're doing better, you are the cultural leaders and that's a big job. You know, Simon has this, this quote that, that you know, we talk about and it's, it's when we get the environment right, people will do great things. And our job after tomorrow afternoon is to go back and get the environment right, to really enable this whole data culture thing.